might want to come up and start loading your presentation. Um, well, thanks, uh, thanks, Dick. Uh, I wanted to, uh, to introduce what we're going to do next, which is the winning undergraduate case presentation from the case competition yesterday by the Stanford undergrad group, and I'll introduce them in just a minute. I'm going to allow them to, uh, I'm going to step aside and use this mic while they, uh, while they plug their uh, presentation into the, uh, into the machine. So what I, what I wanted to do is, is give this a bit of a setup so that you understand what they're going to be presenting. And even before I do that, I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to mention that anyone who you've seen walking around with a green sticky tag on their, uh, on their, on their uh, name tag the last couple of days, those represent all of the participants in the case competition this year. There were 21 uh, teams represented from 19 different schools, and uh, that means approximately 100 uh, young people who are in either undergraduates or graduate school who came to compete in the case competition. The, uh, the case this year, um, by the way, how many Stanford students does it take to load a presentation <laughs> onto? Where is the, we'll use your file. Uh, while, they're, while they're doing that, though. Um, the case this year, and, and I try to pose a different, a different issue for students each year so that we can challenge them in different ways. And this year the case was, um, what is the perfect Cole Hamels trade? This is a topic that's been discussed much in the media these days. Uh, in fact, for the, for the last month or so, and arguably even into the last year or six months. The, um, the, the, the goal was to create the optimal trade, not only from the Philly standpoint, so that it wasn't one-sided, but from the opposing uh, team or the trade partner's perspective as well. So the goal was to pick a trade that made imminent sense to both the Phillies and their trade partner. And in fact, I went one step further in that I asked the students to give us their top two Cole Hamels trades. They were asked to ignore any consideration of Cole Hamill's personal preferences of where he wanted to pitch, or if he had any no-trade clauses in his, uh, in his contract. It really was about just structuring a trade that made a great uh, rational economic sense to the Phillies and to a trade partner. So some of the issues that they were faced with, that all of the case participants were faced with, was determining uh, number one, they had to project Cole Hamill's performance so that they had a sense of what the, what the asset was and what it was worth. Secondly, they also had to determine which teams could benefit enough from uh, attracting him and putting, bringing him in so that they had a, uh, you know, it, it, it materially raised their probability of reaching the postseason, for example. And then, of course, the third piece and one of the highly complex pieces is what would the appropriate trade package in return be? And of course, to do that, you have to be uh, familiar with or steeped in how to value uh, prospects, uh, typically those who have very little mi major league service or in many cases, no, no major league service. So, so this was the challenge that was laid out to all of the teams. I will say that in the undergraduate division, the competition was especially close. And while the Stanford University group that we're seeing here today were, were in fact the winners, uh, both Tufts teams, Tufts team one and Tufts team two, were honestly just a hair behind what the Stanford group presented. Uh, but we do think that the, the judges thought there were some unique aspects to what Stanford came up with and were, uh, and were excited to, to name them as the, as the champ in the undergrad division. I also mentioned that the champs in the grad division, uh, ASU, um, uh, frankly won by, by a bit more of a margin than these folks here. Uh, and they also did a, a really impressive, uh, impressive job with their presentation as well. So are we loaded? With that, I'm going to turn it over to the team captain for the Stanford University undergrads, uh, Jordan Wallach. Hey, 
I guess first off, I'd like to thank Vince and thank Saber, thank our audience. Um, it's a great privilege, excuse me, to be up here in front of uh, such great baseball minds, first of all, um, and to be to be at this conference in the middle of our dead week leading up to finals. On top of that, so um, first off, I'd just like to introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Jordan Wallach. I'm a, I'm from New York City. I'm a sophomore majoring in mathematical and computational science. Uh, I'm Avner Kreps. I'm a freshman from Palo Alto, California, majoring in economics and public policy. I'm Vihan Lakshman. I'm a junior from Savannah, Georgia, majoring in math and computational science. Hi, I'm Alec Powell. I'm a junior from Fairfax, Virginia, majoring in computer science. And I'm Doe Young Park. I'm a junior from St. Paul, Minnesota, majoring in chemical engineering. All right. So once right. our technical issues get out of the way, we'll get started. Okay, perfect. And so getting right into it. Um, so we had three main questions that we wanted to answer um, when we first started the case competition. One, we wanted to forecast the future performance for Cole Hamels as well as... Okay. The future performance for Cole Hamels as well as the performance for uh, the prospects involved um, over the course of Cole Hamels' contract up to 2018. Second, we wanted to identify the teams that stood the most to gain from adding Cole Hamels to their rosters. And third, we wanted to evaluate uh, which, trade, which trade package would, be the most, would, would add the most value to both the Phillies and the team uh, that would be getting a prospect package in return. And so, so the first part that we did, um, okay, great, thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, the first, okay, thanks. The first part that we did um, was to project uh, Hamels' performance over the remaining uh, four years of his contract, so up until 2018. So we started off, we wanted to do a linear regression model. Um, so basically plotting something like ERA minus to age, uh, or strikeout, pres strikeout percentage to age, or walk percentage to age. But the problem with that was that the data is self-selecting. So older players that are still in the league are there for a reason. They've shown that they can perform, and it's, the data is basically skewed by those players who have a longer career longevity. And so the solution to that was an aging curve. And so what we did was that we went all the way back to the start of the expansion era, 1961, and took every player season that qualified for the ERA title. And so we took their total uh, fan graphs war um, and grafted, as you'll see to the right side of the screen here, um, we graphed the total war for each player season corresponding to the age. And that's how we constructed our aging curve. So you'll see here, we have a polynomial uh, best fit line that reflects the aging curve itself with the, in the blue. And we have a scaled Cole Hamels war for every point, every season up to this point in his career. And so you'll see each data point for Cole Hamels is well above the best fit line that we have. And so basically, we, that shows that just the age, his aging curve will be probably above the aging curve that we already uh, have, the historical aging curve that we already have. So what we did, we found the average deviation uh, to the aging curve for Cole Hamels over up to this point in his career, age 30, and we wanted to project it to the future. So we took upper and lower bounds, we subtracted and added that uh, average deviation to the aging curve to find upper and lower bounds for his performance over the rest of his contract. And now I'll introduce Alec Powell, who will talk about uh, how we projected the performance of minor league prospects. Thanks, Jordan. Okay, so the next part of our analysis was actually looking at these minor league prospects that could be included in a trade with the Phillies. And so we estimated that the Phillies are going to demand if at least one, if not multiple, top prospects from the trading partner uh, in this trade. And so for the sake of simplicity in our data gathering process, process, what we did was we considered those current prospects who are rated as the top 10 pros one of the top 10 prospects for their respective teams according to Baseball America's preseason rankings. And so how do we go about projecting these minor league process, prospects? What we did was we actually wrote a computer program that integrates the SQL database to project the value based on comparisons to former top prospects themselves. So our database consists of two tables, the first of which is a master table that contains all data from minor league player seasons going back to 2010. This came from Fangraphs. And then our second table in the database was a major league player table that we manually compiled that contains every team's former top 10 prospects going back to 2010, uh, their age, their career war in the major leagues, and their service time in the major leagues. Uh, and this is just a snippet of some of the code that we wrote to do this. Uh, the 
This is basically how it flowed, the program. Uh, first, like I said, we accumulated our database with all minor league player seasons. And then what we're trying to do is for every top 10 prospect on a trade partner, we're looking to find similar historical minor league seasons. And now how do we do that? What we did was the input to the program takes in the list of the top 10 prospects. And what it does is runs over our entire database looking for comparable seasons. So let's say that one of the top prospects for one of the trade partners last year was at double A and he was age 22. So what our program did was find every instance in the past back to 2010 where a player at age 22 was in double A and had a WOBA of plus or minus 5% of this player's WOBA last year. And so that's how we kind of found comparable statistical seasons to this prospect. Uh, similarly for pitchers, we used FIP in comparisons. And so now that we had our list of comparable players, uh, we had to narrow that down uh, to only include players that were former top 10 prospects themselves. The intuition here was that uh, because we're looking at highly rated prospects, uh, we want to compare them to only prospects who were highly rated themselves in the past. And so for every, using our second table in the database, uh, for every former top 10 prospect, we used his career war divided by his playing time in the major leagues to get some idea of his war per season and then averaged all those values for every uh, match that we found in our database. And that was the value that we actually outputted as the projection for this minor league prospect. So to finish off uh, the program, uh, like I said, we narrowed down by only considering similar or former top 10 prospects. And then we found uh, for each of those matches, their career war divided by seasons played, averaged those values, and that was our output to the program. Uh, so when we fed in an input file, uh, this is the output that we get for the Indians' prospects. So that's just a sample. It's their projected 2015 war. And then what we did was we used uh, Jordan's aging curve to project out to 2018 to get, our, get an idea of how the prospects would fare uh, for those four seasons. So with that, I'll turn it over to Doe, who's going to talk about the impact of Hamels on all of the clubs. Thanks, Alec. So now that we have Jordan's and Alec's methods of projecting both Cole Hamels and Major League prospects across 2015 to 2018, which is our time period of consideration, we have to use that to try and figure out which teams stand the most to gain by adding Hamels to their rotations moving forward into 2018. And so this is kind of the thought process that we took as we went about this process. So the first thing that we did was we established a baseline for 2015. Where do we expect these teams to be at without Hamels? And so we just did a simple linear regression that I'll show you in a second using a hitting and pitching war to determine number of wins. After that, we correlated wins to a playoff probability by creating a logistic regression based on historical data that I'll get into later. And then from there, we redid those win calculations and the playoff probability calculations based on Hamels being added to each team's rotation that we considered. And from there, we narrowed down the list of top six teams because there's a significant gap from the sixth to the seventh of teams that would benefit the most in terms of playoff probability by adding Hamels to their rotation. And so the first thing that I talked about, correlating war to wins to predict each team's baseline 2015 win total, and later on predict the win total with Hamels. And so what I did was I went back through the last 13 years of data, compiled each team, their pitching war, their hitting war, and the number of wins that they had. We also considered a defensive metric, but it turned out to have little to no impact on our linear regression model, so we decided to neglect it altogether to simplify the data process. And so we created the model, the equation you can see there, we got our constants, and this again takes in an expected pitching war, an expected hitting war, and returns the projected number of wins for each team that you can see here, and these are projected 2015 standings based on that mark. And again, on the bottom you can see the cutoffs for the American League and the National League playoffs. And so what we did from here was, considering that we projected by Jordan's model that Hamels would add about three, three pitching wins to his team in the 2015 season, we considered all of the teams around three wins, within three wins of this threshold underneath, so that when you add Hamels, the, we're considering these are the teams that are going to jump into the playoffs or at least make a more significant push, and these teams are denoted in green. Again, uh, all these teams fell within the threshold. Uh, as much as I love the Rockies, and I really do, we had to leave them out because we didn't think that Hamels would take all too well to pitching in an active launch pad for the first twilight years. And so now moving on from there, we decided to correlate wins to playoff probability by this is what I did this by going through the last 20 years of data, so the wild card era, and acting as if there were two teams selected uh, for wild cards in each of those years as it is now. Uh, I went through and for each number of possible wins. So in those 20 years, for every team that won 83 wins, 
that, that got 83 wins. I totaled those teams, and then I computed how many of those made the playoffs or should have made the playoffs, uh, assuming that second wild card win, and we plotted them on uh, the logistic curve that you see there. And even though it's a rather rudimentary way of doing this, it actually fit the data pretty well, our curve did, and the equation for that can be seen there. Uh, correlating again wins to playoff probability. And the biggest observation to note here is that between around 80 and around 90 wins, there's a sweet spot, as we like to call it, where even the addition of one or two, or in our case, three wins, makes an incredible difference in the playoff probability for each team, which is why a lot of these teams that you'll see in a bit benefit so much from the addition of Hamilton as three wins, especially in tight division or wildcard races. And so, Recapping again, Hamels is going to add around three wins to, to the pitching staff and recalculating the wins and playoff probabilities and computing the changes in those values led to, narrow, led to our narrowing down to these six teams. And as you can see, the Indians actually benefit almost 50%, so their playoff prob probability improves by almost 50% by virtue of adding Hamels. And as you can see again, their win total before was 85. They move up to around 88 wins by adding Hamels. And they're well within that sweet spot, which is why you see this enormous noticeable change, and that's what you see from all, a lot of these other teams as well. And so now that we have these teams narrowed down, these prospective trade partners, uh, Ofner is going to start to talk about how we decided to formulate and quantify the trades with these trade partners and starting narrowing them down. Thank you, Doe. So now that uh, we have, thanks to Jordan and Alec, a method of quantitatively um, projecting the wins above replacement of any potential trade chip, uh, including Cole Hamels as well as prospects. And thanks to Doe, we've narrowed down the list of teams that we, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have, uh, that we're considering as trading partners for the Phillies. Uh, now that we've, uh, and we also have developed a metric to quantitatively um, assess how much Hamels will help each of these teams, we can start to develop a quantitative metric to evaluate uh, each potential trade for both the Phillies and their trade partner and optimize that. And eventually we're going to formulate some trades for you guys. So, oops, sorry. So to uh, identify tradable assets for each team, we use this decision tree model. Uh, this is for all players on the MLB roster, so players on the payroll. And so essentially this boils down to uh, two questions. Uh, would the Phillies want to trade for this player, or would the other team, the Phillies trading partner, want to give away this player? So we figured that the Phillies would only want to trade this player if they were under contract through 2018, and if they were under 30, because the Phillies are going to want someone who's going to help them when they hope their next period of contention is. And we figured that the other team would not trade the player if they were too good, so if they had a wins above replacement significantly above that which we projected Hamels for, or if they uh, didn't have a backup plan at that same position. And we identified as a backup plan a uh, wins above replacement between that player and their backup of about three wins or, uh, or less, or if they had a top prospect at that same position. And since, since these are win now teams, we only counted top prospects uh, in double or triple A because we only wanted prospects that were close to helping the uh, major league club at that time. So, oh, I can't get the hang of this. So. Uh, like we said, uh, we evaluated each team's positional needs based on uh, wins above replacement of current starters and backups, the existence of top prospects or lack thereof at each position, and that player's age and years of control remaining. And so we combined each of these factors into two sort of weight matrices for each team, uh, including the Phillies. One of these weight matrices gave the willingness of that team to give away players at a certain position, and the other one gave the uh, willingness or desire to receive players at that position. We assigned a value for each position for each matrix. Uh, additionally, what we did is we um, gave each team a win now versus win later weights. So for example, for the six teams that are potential trading partners for the Phillies, those are win now teams. So the wins in like the coming seasons, 2015 and 2016, are going to be weighted more in our model. Whereas for the Phillies, they, they're more of a win later team. So in t their wins in 2017 and 2018 are going to be valued a lot more. So now I'm going to turn it over to Vihan, who's going to talk about our trade machine. Thanks, Avner. So just to briefly recap, thanks to Doe and Avner's projections, we have our six potential trading partners with the Phillies, and we've identified our list of prospects and players on the MLB roster who could be involved in this Cole Hamels deal. And thanks to Jordan and Alec, we have four-year war projections for the next four seasons for all of these players that uh, Doe and Ovner identified. So now we actually need to get some trades. And to do that, we wrote a computer program in Python that we affectionately called the trade machine that 
essentially simulates different trades and gets, uh, gets us the best possible score. And the algorithm roughly works by taking in a list of tradable assets for each team. And first, uh, between the Phillies and a trade partner, you, of course, send over Cole Hamels to the other team. And then we simulate all one-to-one -one trades, so send over one player back to the Phillies, compute that score, and then try sending over two players from the trade partner and then send over two players from the Phillies and just loop over all the different combinations. And we cut off the program at sending at the Phillies sending two players to the trade partner and the partner sending over five players because we made the assumption that the trade wouldn't involve more than seven players in total. So from this, we can compute some scores for each team based on sending players back and forth. And to do that, we have these two running scores that work roughly by subtracting the value of a player that a team gives away from that player's score and adding the value that that player adds to the trade partner to that score. And note that those values are different for each team because we weight by one, how much this team is willing to win, wants to win in a particular season, and we multiply that by the sum of the war. And we also weight by these positional matrices which tell us how much a team is willing to give away a player of a certain position and how much a team is willing to take on a player of the certain position. So we simulate these trades back and forth and compute these running trade scores. And at the end, we ultimately get these two final scores, S sub A and S sub B. And ultimately, at the heart of our trade machine is this optimization problem. So we want to maximize the score for each team, which tells us which the greatest possible benefit out of all of our trades. But we also subject this to the constraint that the difference between the two scores is within some threshold value, which in our program we define to be 0.1, because we don't want one team to grossly benefit over the other in this trade, because otherwise then that trade would not happen. So with these trade scores, we can now compute our perfect Cole Hamels trade under this optimization problem. Here's an example of a sample input we feed the trade machine. This is for the Yankees. On the far left, you see the list of players who could potentially be involved in this deal, as well as their projected four-year f wars. And on the far right, you see these positional vectors, which are weights of how much this team wants to win now versus win later. Or, sorry, how much this team is willing to give away a player of a certain position and willing to receive a player of this position. And note that we define these values to be 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 1, and 1.5, which were heuristic weights that we determine on a discrete scale. And at the bottom, you see these win now versus win later weights, which tell us for each of the next four seasons, how much is this team invested in winning? So you see for the Phillies, we decided that to be zero in 2015 because they're not as invested in winning in that year. So through this, we can finally get some trades. And here's a snippet of the code we wrote, which loops through all the different possibilities. And here's one sample output that we get through this machine. Here you see an example of the Phillies trading with the Yankees. You see the players being exchanged and the final trade score and the scores for each team. And note that the scores are relatively close because we constrain our optimization to make sure that the scores are mutually equitable for each team. And now we can finally tell you what our perfect Cole Hamels trade is. All right, so uh, like the case said, we're gonna have two trades for you guys, and I'm gonna go over using a combination of quantitative and qualitative factors, uh, which we decided was our best Cole Hamels trade and which was second best. So our first trade, uh, the Phillies are trading with the Mariners. The Mariners are getting Cole Hamels, of course, and Darren Roof in exchange for Cattell Marte, DJ Peterson, Taiwan Walker, Patrick Kivlahan, and Edward Diaz. So in our second trade, we have the Phillies and the Yankees trading. The Yankees are getting Cole Hamels and Ben Revere in exchange for Gary Sanchez, Greg Bird, Didi Gregorius, Rob Refsnyder, and Jacob Lindgren. So the uh, first metric we used in evaluating which trade was the best was the uh, total trade score metric that Vihan talked about that the trade machine optimized. So for this Yankees trade, as you can see, it's uh, roundabouts of 5.5, 5, 5 and a half, whereas for the Mariners trade, it's a lot lower, uh, 4.114. And this is no accident. In fact, the trade machine really loved having the Phillies trade with the Yankees. The top 10, uh, the 10th place Yankees trade in terms of trade score was higher than the top one trade for any of the other teams that we considered, which was a little surprising to us, but that's the trade machine. So uh, for, for, that, uh, for that reason and for a few other reasons, we decided that this Yankees trade was going to be our uh, number one trade and the Mariners trade was going to be our number two trade. There are a few other qualitative factors to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, the uh, Yankees are actually $14 million less in terms of payroll than they were at the end of 2014, whereas the uh, Mariners 
are actually a one million over their end of the season payroll for that year. So we figure that the Yankees are going to be more uh, willing to take on Cole Hamels' contract. Uh, second of all, the Mariners have a very strong starting rotation. Taiwan Walker, who you can see is traded here, who's like a very highly, former very highly regarded prospect, and the Mariners have high hopes for him. Um, he's actually projected by our war projections to be their number five starter for the coming year. So we figured that the marginal benefit that the Mariners would get from adding a pitcher to their already stacked rotation would not be as high as the marginal benefit of the Yankees adding Cole Hamels maybe to their uh, little worse rotation. Uh, and finally, we figured one of the uh, most important trade chips that was being traded in this trade was Didi Gregorius. But it's important to mention that the Yankees' number three prospect by uh, Baseball America, who is Jorge Mateo, is a shortstop. He's in rookie league, which is why we didn't um, uh, we, which is why we didn't factor him into our decision tree model earlier, but it's an important qualitative factor to note. Uh, additionally, we figured that the Yankees already have two proven major league middle infielders, uh, Stephen Drew and Brendan Ryan, who can sort of hold down the fort while uh, Jorge Mateo gets prepped for the big leagues, and they will also provide that same caliber of defense, particularly Brendan Ryan, that Didi Gregorius did. So for those reasons, as well as the quantitative reasons of the trade score, we decided that this Yankees trade would be our number one choice uh, for our Cole Hamels trade. So now I'm going to hand it over to Alec to talk about some risk analysis. Thanks, Avner. So in terms of risk analysis, looking at prospect projections, uh, what we initially thought uh, tended to come out true, which is that basically our risk is kind of implicit within the program that we wrote. Uh, because when we're considering all comparable minor league seasons, we're looking at all former uh, minor league prospects. And those prospects could have done really well in the major leagues, and some of them have flopped in the major leagues. So the result kind of matches our intuition. Uh, when we're looking at younger players, there's going to be uh, higher levels of risk uh, because they haven't accumulated as much playing time, perhaps in the major leagues yet. Uh, and then for current major league players, we're going to have higher, accu more accurate uh, projections for them. Right, and as Alec just mentioned, so we have our projections off of projections, so to speak. So Alec, Alec's program outputs a projection uh, for each minor leaguer for their 2015 F4. Um, and then further, we're using our major league aging curve to kind of propagate, which it, it actually propagates the error a little bit. It projects off a of projection. But something that we did for Cole Hamels, for example, is that we considered the worst and best case scenario that each team is going to get out of Cole Hamels. So that kind of accounts for the variability uh, from, the, uh, from the general trend curve and kind of accounts for that error uh, slightly. Second, the, the war method for, uh, for projecting wins, as Joe mentioned earlier, it's best for middle of the pack teams. It's not as good for a team, let's say, that's above 90 wins, that's projected for above 90 wins, or a team maybe that's projected below something like 75 wins. Uh, but the thing with that is that we're only kind of considering these middle of the pack teams, teams that, can, that stand the most to gain from adding one, two, or three wins with Cole Hamels, which can make all the difference between making the postseason and potentially making a run at the World Series or falling just short of that mark. And lastly, we I tested uh, all of our trade machine outputs for sanity. I mean, we trust the trade machine, but how much do we really trust it? <laughs> so, uh, so we made sure each of those trades that, we, that the trade machine spat out were actually viable in the major league market today. And now, uh, Vian will talk about some suggestions for improvement uh, with our model. Yeah, thanks, Jordan. There are a lot of exciting directions that we can take this project going forward to improve our models. First and foremost, as we just talked about, there is this disconnect between our minor league and major league projection systems and this error propagation going on. So it would be very nice to figure out what sort of scaling there is between these two models to understand how they relate to one another, or maybe even find a more unifying model out there. And in addition, our trade machine program could also be more robust. Right now, it can only simulate two team trades, but it would be very cool to simulate all possible roster transactions, such as three team trades, cash considerations, et cetera. And in addition, um, those weight vectors that I referred to earlier were heuristically determined. We looked at the rosters and just made a judgment with those discrete and assign those discrete values. But it would be feasible to go through, similar to what we did with Hamels, and figure out how removing a player would change their playoff probability and then assign more uh, analytical values to that. And finally, at the end of the day, baseball is a business. And we could correlate our, the trade scores that we output with monetary values to determine a more tangible cost associated with roster transactions. In this project, we simply focused on the currency of wins because we made the assumption that the teams interested in trading for Hamels are the teams heavily invested in winning now. 
but at the same time, revenue maximization is a serious consideration, and that's something that we could take into account to improve on our model and our projections. And so with that, that's going to conclude our presentation. Again, we'd like to thank Vince and all the other minds behind this annual conference uh, for the opportunity. It's been an absolute honor for us to present this to you as we get ready for our final exams next week. And uh, it's, been, it's been an absolute blast. It's been an honor. Thank you very much. Well, um, I, I hope you were uh, as impressed as, as the judges were. Uh, and you know, I think, I think one of the, um, the, a couple things. Number one is we're not so focused on what the actual answer was in this instance, whether you thought that this was the optimal trade. It was really more about the thought process that they put into it. And again, as I said, many other teams were, were very impressive as well. So this was just one shining example of what we've got here. The, the other thing I thought that really impressed the judges was the fact that they actually took it to suggestions for improvement. So here they are creating some innovative work that they put a lot of time and effort into, and instead of sort of resting on that and saying, this is it, they're already thinking about the things, if they had more time, that they could do to make it even, even better and make it more realistic. And also, I want to add another thing that impressed the judges was the fact that they, that they recognized that there was the need to check the model, right? Not just to rely on the model output without regard for you know, the, the eye test, as it was called. So I think on so many fronts, um, the, the Stanford team shined. And, and also, I, I, I want you to think of them as, as really representative of what we have in this case competition and some of the uh, uh, great young minds out there that have both a passion for the game and a, and a technical know-how of how to integrate information and data perhaps into decision processes. And I know each one of these young men behind me would, would advocate that this is, again, just one more input into what is otherwise a complex decision versus the final answer sheet. So uh, thanks so much to the, uh, to the group and to all the participants in this year's case competition. Um, we won't really have time for any other questions, so what we're going to do is we're going to roll right into the next presentation because we're